So tonight I'd like to begin uh, by sharing a story that a friend sent to me, a true story, uh, about an elephant whisperer. And uh, his name's Lawrence Anthony, and some of you may have heard of him because he's a renowned conservationist who died in March. And his fame comes primarily because uh, in South Africa there have been these herds of wild rogue elephants that um, have been so violent that it's become, you know, over time the habit to just to kill them. And he found a way uh, through his presence and sensitivity and capacity to communicate to actually calm down and rehabilitate, so to speak, these these elephants. And what was so powerful is that after he died, I think, let's see, it was March 7th, there was this solemn procession of these herds of elephants, two of them, to his compound over the next two days. And it's said that elephants do mourn their own dead somehow they attuned to the fact that this friend of theirs had died and solemnly just crossed, you know, miles and miles and then for uh, two days kind of stood vigil in front of his compound. So I read a little bit more about him because I was, that kind of gave me chills, you know, the good kind of chills of sensing this a level of nonverbal relatedness and intimacy that's possible. And um, he described a bit of some of his experiences in, in uh, working with these elephants. One uh, female and her baby, she was really, really, she was kind of a leader and particularly um, animated, angry, and violent. And he described, and, and if she hadn't in some way cooperated with him, they, uh, they would, her and her babies and the whole herd would have been killed off. He managed to talk to her and then attend, just take her in, in a way that made contact. He, he describes this moment of recognition in some way that there was caring, that there was safety, that there was kinship. Okay, so, I bring this up because I, my sense is that true service and true fulfillment comes from this capacity to cultivate these connections, this kind of bonding, this kind of attu- having this attunement where we can communicate our love and our understanding in a way that wakes us up beyond our own sense of separate self and and allows us to feel a shared belonging. That that is what heals. One of my favorite teachings in the Buddhist tradition comes from Zen Master Dogen. He says, to be enlightened is to be intimate with all things. And I love that expression you know, intimate with all things, with elephants and toddlers and elderly and the cycles of the moon and the stars in the sky and the blossoms in front of us and the rain and our own sadness and our own excitement, to be intimate with life. And, and this intimacy, I, I think it's a wonderful word and there's a reason we named our retreats here in the Washington area, Intimacy with Life because it really encompasses the whole spiritual path. Intimacy, the the true meaning of it, we often think of it just in terms of romantic relationships. But the, the broad and deep meaning of intimacy is this realization of our mutual belonging, of our shared belonging, and the quality of, of care and understanding that arises from that. So, I think of Lawrence Anthony and I think of that, that mutual recognition and the intimacy that he had and, and how, um, what does it all come from? How are we able to cultivate this quality? 
of belonging, of sensing our belonging, communicating in that way. And it comes from paying attention. And paying attention is the key to being intimate. It's said that paying attention is the purest expression of love. So tonight I'd like to kind of do some reflecting together on meditation as a training for intimacy, for intimacy with life. And, and it's a huge, broad subject, so I'll kind of focus it on certain domains. But the starting point, when I talk about intimacy with life, this unconditional presence and open-heartedness, is it's possible. You know, we might not be able to, you know, have wall-to-wall intimacy with life, but it is possible to really have, true, truly have swaths of our life where we're living in that, that sense of connectedness. I remember the Buddha teaching, you know, this is a very, very simple teaching about what I think of as our evolutionary potential. And he said, I would not teach you this path if it was not possible. So it's possible. And, as most of us know, if we really look honestly, you know, at our day and at what happens moment to moment, is that we have this very universal conditioning playing through us that has us grasp after things and push things away and try to control our life in a way that impedes intimacy. Every one of us is, is rigged with that. So we have the conditioning and intimacy is possible. I think part of what I'd like to emphasize tonight is that our moments of true intimacy are when we stop controlling. Okay? That we have to let go of the controls in order to experience that contactfulness and tenderness. And you can see it in, in the small things. If you're nervous about a an upcoming social event and you start rehearsing, you know, and thinking about what you're going to wear and, and kind of planning it in some way, you're not intimate with those moments. You're not intimate and in touch with your own anxiety. Rather, you're busy kind of trying to protect your future. We can see it. We can see how we move away from intimacy with our inner life. And when we're with another person, if there's any agenda to get something, to get their approval, to in some way have them be different, you know. In those moments we can't be attuned to what's happening and open-hearted. Our attention has narrowed and tightened. So you might just, as we begin this kind of exploration, reflect on today for a moment. Let's just scan today. And this isn't so that we judge ourselves and say, oh, I'm a flop, I, I wasn't intimate for like 10 seconds. But just take a moment to just look at today so we sense our patterns. You know, just consider for yourself how many moments were there where there wasn't some controlling, where you might have just been resting in the present. You know, moments where you we're aware of the changing stream of sensations inside you or maybe listening to the thunder and the rain and just listening maybe just in some way with another person listening without an agenda or maybe for some moments present with your own heart or whatever feelings were there of nervousness or happiness or whatever it was. Were there moments when you stopped? And you might be reviewing and sense, well, you had a lot to do today. And when you have a lot to do, there's obviously this kind of goal-oriented and we get caught in thoughts and thinking and isn't that natural? And the truth is it's totally natural 
But to accomplish what we need to accomplish, we do not always have to be in that trance of leaning forward, always planning, always figuring. It's possible to be in activity and still be here. It's possible. It's possible to pause and take some breaths and come back. So the question is, what stops us? What keeps us on that kind of train that is just tearing forward, trying like crazy to get everything done because we think there's not enough time, to trying to get somewhere and always on its way somewhere else other than here? What stops us from coming back? You might sense that for yourself. What stops you? Or maybe imagine, if you pause in the middle of things, what do you feel? What do you get in touch with? When you just stop for a moment and sense, okay, what's going on inside here? I can say for myself what I get in touch with is a mix of anxiety and restlessness. Anxiety like something's wrong, something's going to go wrong, and restlessness like there's something more to do or think or feel or get to. And what I found when I interview people about this is that's pretty common, that most of the time there's a, a current of that underneath. So we start looking and we start sensing the ways that we're avoiding being here, that in some way we're racing away from the present moment because we don't want to feel that uncomfortableness that something's missing or something's wrong. So I invite you to just not necessarily believe that that's true, but check it out for yourself. Is there something that's keeping you kind of racing from the present moment? I like the image of bicycling away from the present moment and that the more that anxiety is there, actually the faster we're pedaling so we don't have to feel it. We're under this illusion that if we pedal faster, we'll get enough done to soothe the anxiety so then we can rest and then we can enjoy, you know. Okay, so one of our big ways of of not being intimate is speeding around. Can you be intimate with your inner life if you're moving fast. I can't. Can you be intimate with another person if you're on your way somewhere else? Speed's a flag. It's so much a part of the culture. It's really an accepted mode of of being. Yet, when we're rushing away from the anxiety in the present moment, we can't be... we're not available. But I sense how pervasive it is. I was at the bank the other day and the teller was having trouble with a transaction that she was doing and just every like 15 seconds she kept saying, thank you for your patience, thank you for your patience, you know. And I realized, oh, she's really used to how impatient we are that we all feel like we just don't have enough time and that's part of customer relations is the faster you get it done, the more they're going to like your bank, you know. So thank you for your patience is like a way of saying, I get it and I'm really trying and I'm addressing what you're worried about, that it's going to be slow. But what's it like for you when you're waiting in a long line or in traffic? We start getting in touch with that rawness, that anxiety that we're really trying to get away from. So, I'm speaking more generally of how we avoid being intimate with our moments in daily life. We can also see it in a formal meditation practice. You know, one of the elephants in the room, and this is a different kind of elephant, with meditation communities, is that there's an underlying teaching that really formal practice, like physical exercise, this mental exercise of paying attention, can transform our life and wake up our hearts and really bring a lot of freedom. And it takes practice, you know. And the the elephant is that, and I can ask you this, how many of you have the sense of either it's re- you're having a really hard time practicing at all or you're not practicing enough? Like you're, you really aren't doing what you th- wish you could be doing. Can I just see by hands how many of you feel it's, it's less than what you would hope? 
Okay, so I would say that's about 75, 80% of who's here. I'm saying that for those that are, are listening to podcasts or watching, that that's pervasive. Most of us have these things we know would be good for us. And meditation's one of them. And yet, what makes it so hard? Well, what is meditation but sitting down into the present moment and actually contacting the layers that we are pretty busy trying to run away from a lot of the time? I mean, there's parts of meditation that don't feel like that, that where we're just relaxing and maybe just, you know, being with the breath. But when we start being mindful and opening to what's here, there might be layers that aren't so pleasant. So it's uncomfortable. And we don't, and because we don't feel like we're good at it, you know, because all of our minds are designed to be distracted, so we think we have a busy mind different than everybody else's busy mind, you know. We don't think we're doing well and we don't like doing things that we don't think we're good at. Does that make sense? So we're trying to avoid not feeling good and we keep busy. Now what happens in our relationships with each other? How do we avoid intimacy, that presence with each other? And that, that gets to be a pretty juicy area to look at. For many people, if I said, okay, so this is about training ourselves, using meditation as a training for intimacy, there's a number of people that want to make for the door, you know, that, that's, that's the sign of racing to the exit. You know, they get, they get chills, but not the good kind of chills, you know. I remember uh, Jules Pfeiffer cartoon where she's saying, but I love you. And he's saying, don't you threaten me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and from the point of view of the separate self, I mean, what is intimacy? We want it like crazy. I mean, we long for belonging and for the separate self, it's a dangerous risky prospect. We might get rejected, we might get possessed and suffocated, things go wrong. So for many people, instead of, um, you know, going for it, it's like we want it, but we hold on tight to the controls because we're protecting ourselves. And the controls protect us, in a way, from intimacy. So you might sense, you know, today, What was it like? Was there presence with others? Or was there an agenda of some sort, a protection of some sort? I mean, think of the ways we protect. Think of the ways that we keep control. Uh, For many of us in relationships, one of the, the major ways that we do it is there's a demand on the relationship, you be a certain way. You know, I love you, but I'll really love you if you just change and be like this and cooperate and hold up your end in the household or what, whatever it is. We want our partner or our teen or whatever to adjust and um, be different. Some of you might remember this story about a couple celebrating their golden wedding anniversary and their domestic tranquility had been the talk of the town. And so a local newspaper reporter wanted to find out, you know, what, what was really their secret to this long, happy marriage. And the man said, well, it dates back to our honeymoon. We visited the Grand Canyon, took a trip down to the bottom of the canyon by mule. We hadn't gone too far when my wife's mule stumbled and my wife quietly said, and my wife quietly said, that's once. We proceeded a little further when the mule stumbled again and she spoke again. She said, that's twice. We hadn't gone a half mile when the mule stumbled a third time and my wife promptly pulled a revolver from her pocket and shot it. I started to protest over her treatment of an innocent creature and she looked at me and quietly said, that's once. (laughs) I, I apologize for the cruelty to any animal that's embedded in that joke. But you get the idea that we actually have unsaid, sometimes they're unsaid and sometimes they're stated rules on how the other has to be for us to be okay with them. 
and that's for, that's for real. I can I can see it uh, with my son that you know when whenever I have an agenda, you know we have our phone calls, and if there's something in the background where there's an agenda, we don't have a real sense of connection. He can feel it. For a long time, the agenda was, did you get your grad school applications in? You know. But there's other ones. Did you call the doctor? I mean, I feel like the classic Jewish mother. Did you get? Did you get that appointment? Did you pay this tax? You know, whenever I have an agenda in the background, it's tight. So sometimes, when I'm good, before I'll pick up the phone or when I'll see him on there, you know, I'll say, okay, just this is just presence. No, no, nothing I want from him. Nothing I want from me. And there's a spontaneity that happens, and a warmth. And, and there's something real that we can sense our belonging. So we have different ways that we control, that we disconnect. You know, often it's that we want something from somebody, we want their approval. That's a big one. How many moments are we with somebody and there can't be real intimacy because we're wanting them to have a certain way of experiencing us. So we're not being natural, we're presenting the self we want them to see, right? That's not going to make for intimacy. Or for many, we have ideals in our mind and now I'm talking about, especially with love relationships, ideals of really the kind of person that then my life, it's the if only mine, then it would work out. And I think of this, uh, one of the best singles ad that I've ever heard about, single black female seeks male companionship, ethnicity unimportant. I'm a very good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, riding in your pickup truck, hunting, camping, fishing trips, cozy winter nights lying by the fire. This is meeting someone's ideal, right? Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. Rub me the right way and watch me respond. I'll be at the front door when you get home from work wearing only what nature gave me. Kiss me and I'm yours. Call, gives a phone number and ask for Daisy. Over 15,000 men found them talking to the Atlanta Humane Society about an eight-week-old black Labrador retriever. <laughs> I, I shared that with you because I just went through the, la the last month of uh, adopting a, a pup from, a, you know, from one of these places and I know how I was scanning on the online because I was looking for the perfect pup, you know. And you fall in love with who's there. But we have these ideas and they get in the way. Even when we're with somebody, and again this is more in the romantic realm, and things are going pretty well. I have a friend, it's in this case, that she was, everything was really cooking, but something in her, instead of enjoying it, she was computing, is this going to last? Is he really the right one? Am I going to do something that's going to cause, you know, she couldn't just be. Intimacy is hard. It has, it means that we have to keep watching all our habitual exit strategies judging, you know, in some way pulling back when we feel threatened, lashing out, all the ways that we in some way keep ourselves occupied instead of really being there. Mm -hmm.